Today's edition of Resetting the State is entitled Governance for New Beginnings, Resilient Boards and Crisis Management, and examines through the eyes of leading decision makers on the global front lines, current realities and future roles of arts boards in a rapidly transforming sector. Today's discussion will consider how have recent and ongoing events evolved the roles and responsibilities of an arts board? To what extent should a board steer an organization's strategy during crises? How can an organization build a resilient, crisis-proof board? It is a distinct honor to welcome our illustrious panel. Mexican philanthropist and arts leader Barbara Herrera de Garza is board chairman of Escuela Superior de Musica y Danza de Monterrey and board chairman of the Rosa de los Vientos Cultural Center in the city of Monterrey. Graduate of Instituto Tecnológico y de Estudios Superiores de Monterrey and, uh, and Universidad de Monterrey, Barbara Herrera holds an honorary doctorate from the Consorcio Educativo Internacional Warden and has been the recipient of numerous prizes for her work in supporting music and dance in Mexico, including the Jose Pablo Moncayo Award and Festival de Morelia Award. Brian Henderson of Rockefeller Capital Management has devoted more than 43 years to the international and domestic financial services industry. He spent the major part of his career at Merrill Lynch and CO, serving in various capacities, including chairman of global public sector. Currently, Henderson serves as independent director for the Bank of Africa, as well as a range of other commercial boards. Recent board service also includes Vice Chairman and Treasurer of the Atlantic Council of the United States and Board of Trustees for the National Museum of American Indian and Trustee of the American Indian College. Named one of the 50 smartest women in business and the top 50 Hispanic women in business by Money Magazine and Hispanic Business Magazine, Hilda Ochoa Brillenburg, the founder and former CEO and Chairman Emeritus of Strategic Investment Group a graduate of Venezuela's Universidad Católica Andrés Bello and Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, and prior to founding Strategic Investment Group, served as Chief Investment Officer of the World Bank Group. An innovative and influential philanthropist and social entrepreneur, Ochoa is founding chairman of the Orchestra of the Americas Group, has served as a member of the Executive Committee of Boston's New England Conservatory and as board member at the Atlantic Council of the United States the International Monetary Fund Credit Union, General Mills, the McGraw-Hill Companies, the National Symphony Orchestra of the United States, and the Washington National Opera, among other institutions. Janice Suskind is Managing Director of Boozy and Hoax Music Publishers. Suskind joined the organization in 1980, learning the classical music publishing business from the ground up and leading the expansion of composer lists to encompass many of the leading figures in classical music today. Beyond her role at Boozy and Hoax, she has served as chairman of the Society for the Promotion of New Music, as a trustee of the Royal College of Music, and on the board of English National Opera. She is currently a trustee of the Britain Peers Foundation and a council member of the Royal Philharmonic Society. Veronica Wadley is a co-founder, trustee, and former chair of the London Music Fund, and serves in a chair position for the Model Music Curriculum. She has been Chair of Arts Council London, a member of the National Council, Governor of the Yehudi Menuhin School, member of the City of London Education Board, and is a member uh, of the Council of the Royal College of Music. While editor of the Evening Star, she chaired the Evening Star Theatre Awards and Film Awards. Wally has also served as deputy editor of both the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph. Katya Gorbatyuk is a senior financial services and management professional with over 20 years of experience at Merrill Lynch, Credit Suisse, and Barclays. For nearly a decade, Ms. Gorbatyuk has been leading a strategic joint venture for UK-based Plexus Holdings, providing sustainable technologies to the oil and gas industry. Ms. Gorbatyuk is a long-standing member of board and leadership committees of high-impact non-profit organizations, including the Global Leaders Program, the London Symphony Orchestra, the London Music Fund, the Orchestra of the Americas, Midorian Friends, Gift of Life, and others. Christine Hunter 
who served as chairman of the board of New York's Metropolitan Opera from 2005 until 2012, as well as board chairman of the Washington National Opera and other leading arts organizations, unfortunately had a sudden family emergency that prevented her from joining today's session. Our UNA facilitator today will be Alina Haig of Classical Next, who will return to the broadcast in the second half of today's session. But first, to begin, it is my pleasure to welcome today's moderator, Katya Gorbachuk, to set the stage for where our discussion begins. Katya, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gosia, for this introduction. And my huge thanks to all the panelists for joining us here today and for sharing your valuable experiences with the audience, with all of us. So today's topic is um, board governance, and in particular, what makes board governance today great in, in, in today's conditions? What are the key ingredients for successful crisis management? And why are we talking about that? Simply because governance is a key driver of performance. Board governance is the art of collaborative decision making, of teamwork at the very top of organization. Board works on behalf of, and here is the important bit, not only on behalf of shareholders, but, all on, uh, but also on behalf of a whole system of stakeholders, of employees, of customers, the public, the local community, and the goal is, of course, to create long-term value. The Anglo-American model of governance has evolved over the past couple of centuries, and particularly over the past hundred years is being promoted as a global standard. Here's how it evolved then and now. So in normal operations, the role of the board is to support the executive team, to watch what they do, to inspire them to do it better, to challenge them, to support them, to engage in an interesting, challenging and constructive debate. But we are not living today in normal times. Today, multiple crises are colliding, the health crisis, the humanitarian crisis, environmental crisis, and social crisis. And perhaps this is the most severe set of circumstances that the boards are facing for the past 75 years. And these circumstances are testing the limits of every organization. Some organizations will fail, some will come out severely undermined, but the best led organizations will emerge substantially enforced and sub with a substantially higher potential and wisdom. Governance quality will be the key differentiator in all of this. And while it's not up to the board to run an organization, during the times of uncertainty, the executive teams should draw on the board's resources like never before. So as a group of people with a common challenge, we're here to share our recent experiences, particularly on how the, the, the role of the board has evolved over the past several months. How, what's the board's role in future-proofing the organization and what really a resilient board is. So before turning to my panelists with the first question, and the first question will um, be around recent lessons. Before doing that, I would like to engage the audience in an interactive poll. And I would like to ask uh, uh, the management of this program to pull up the poll settings for the audience. So the poll is, has the board that you either work on or you know of or you're familiar with anything in the ecosystem around you, have they been communicated, communicating more or less during the recent months, during lockdown? So the, uh, uh, please answer yes or no. Thank you so much. And we will announce the results of the poll in the course of these discussions. And we really, really appreciate your feedback. So please do answer. So my first question will uh, be to the panel, um, starting with Janice Saskin. Thank you so much. And the uh, first question will be, as I said, about recent lessons. How well do you think we were prepared to face this situation? Were we able to respond to challenges in real time? Well, that depends on which boards and where you were located. Uh, as you know from my association, I'm in a for-profit board, namely a bank. And I will say that uh, the bank, by virtue of having lived through the uh, 08 financial crisis, was probably in a better position to respond 
and the problems that came up during this crisis. So in one sense, we were better prepared because the foundation on which these institutions have been better regulated, we're in a better position to respond to the problem. And secondly, and I think this, this applies to everyone, we have the benefit of a technological and communication infrastructure today, which is infinitely better than at any time in the past. And so as long as we're able to communicate, even by this medium, it shows that there is a way to confront the unknown and certainly and in this case we were not prepared for it generally as a society worldwide thanks that's a great takeaway brian there because so uh, having faced crisis in the past definitely prepares you for similar circumstances in the future so were you in fact communicating as the board members uh, um, more during this time absolutely we were communicating <laughs> we had to communicate because of the rapidly deteriorating financial and economic situation across the entire organization of the institution. I'm speaking specifically about the bank. So the Bank of Africa, which is headquartered in Casablanca, Morocco, is um, a publicly listed company in Morocco, but we operate in 32 countries, of which 27 are in sub-Saharan Africa. So by just the sheer volume of the nature of the problem, we had to communicate and communicate quickly, especially in all of the different uh, board committees, namely our governance committee, our uh, audit committee, and our risk committees. So rather than having quarterly meetings, we as a board instituted having at first biweekly meetings. And those bi-weekly meetings coincided with the regularly scheduled quarterly meetings, but now they have continued on and will continue throughout this year. Thank you, Brian. Hilda, what about your board or boards, may I say, because you wear many hats. Uh, no, thank you, and I, I'm delighted to be part of this fantastic panel. Um, good day to everyone who's listening. The uh, the the board the boards are like an active audience to a performance uh, stage. In a way, the how good the audience is, how active it is, how prepared to accept errors and allow them to be fixed, makes a big difference in the resilience of an organization. We have been fortunate in a way that at the Orchestra of the Americas, and I lar largely refer to the experience of the orchestra itself, that we have a very innovative and creative staff, that our business model is such that we never expect anything to be certain. Uh, we never know for sure. Our tours take us to very different countries with very different levels of development and infrastructure supporting our performances. So we are all globally prepared to, uh, to correct, to, to make mistakes if we need to, to try new things. And if, the, if, if it, there is a mistake to correct the mistake and no one blames anybody for any mistakes. So our board has learned over 20 years to be a very open board and capable of encouraging staff to be creative, to be inventive, to make errors and to correct the errors very quickly. So yes, we have been in constant communication. When the crisis hit us, we were in the middle of almost ready to have our gala, which is a major source of funding for, our, for us. I was coming from Europe when in America, the crisis was yet not as visible as it has become. And it was clear to me that it could become, we, I, we did not know, but we immediately started planning for what could be, meaning the cancellation of the gala negotiating with the hotels. All of this moved very fast. So that we are we are a, a seniors, um, agile organization, as the, the, the business uh, theorists like to call organizations, we are agile. And, and, the, and, the, and the board is relatively agile, although sometimes it anchors us to some of the things they're proud of, which need to be handled. Uh, and, the, and the board chair has to handle that. The people who are proud of certain achievements and don't want to 
move away from them so quickly. There are some people who are proud of, proud of being dinosaurs. Before dinosaurs were extinguished, they were proud to be dinosaurs because they ruled the earth. So there's always that, yeah. that give and take word. And we definitely need both categories of people there, definitely. Um, Veronica, would you kindly turn on your camera and uh, please uh, share with us your experience over the last few months. Have you been communicating as a board more often? And please stay on the camera. That's, we would love to see you at all times. <laughs> And unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's good. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, great. Go ahead. Great to join you all. And, and it's going to be fascinating hearing other people's experiences because although in many ways every board is different, depending on the chairman and the business, they have many things in common. Um, I, I'm fortunate enough now, I'm, I suppose you could say, a professional non exec. I sit on nine different boards. And that's everything from um, arts charities, schools, academies, university, and including also a, a FTSE 100 uh, company, which has a, a market capital of over 5 billion. So it's from 5 billion down to 500,000 a year turnover. So it's a huge range. But they do have a lot in common in a very strange way, quite apart from cash in, cash out. I think we all know about that. But um, I think that if we're honest, um, nobody was prepared for the scale of this crisis. Um, I haven't met anyone, and I certainly, on all the boards that I sit on, uh, have not seen any re risk register that had global pandemic on, at the top right-hand side of the chart. Um, if anyone had that, then they were very clever because um, most people certainly didn't. Um, but the test, obviously, of a, of a good board is how well you react to these extraordinary circumstances. Um, and a risk register, obviously, is important because it means that the executive is thinking about problems ahead and thinking possibly of different financial scenarios. So that is really important. Um, and I would say that um in the uh, the beginning of the crisis and particularly at the start of the lockdown uh every board went into a whole different uh, model of working um i was um with my nine different boards i was doing zoom meetings three or four a day there were emergency meetings for most organizations at least once a week if not more and then gradually, uh, as uh, we became more knowledgeable about the pandemic, uh, we started to think about our short term measures and then a little bit later on thinking about the long term. And that was obviously really important. And to be honest, if we hadn't had Zoom, I think we'd all be in a very different place, particularly the mute button, which is very important for boards. But um, uh, We've, we've, we, I think most good organizations have well-developed digital strategies, and I think that is really important and are well-connected, well-connected through social media with their audience. Um, but money in, money out, that's the big challenge. Thank you, thank you, Veronica. So Barbara, can we go to you? What, what was your experience? Have you been talking to each other as a board more often during these months? Yeah, yeah. Well, first, I'm very honored to be here with you all, sharing our experiences. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, we, we as, a, as, a, as an organization, uh, we were not well prepared for this pandemic or this crisis. But however, we are used to work with adversity. I am from Mexico, and uh, a couple of years ago, all our cultural efforts in, in our country uh, uh, are in a survival mode because our federal government decided to cut all the resources for the, for the cultural activities and institutions. So we are used to, to, to be li like in a survival mode all the time. So uh, we were not prepared, but we are used to, to adversity. And of course. We are used to adversity. It is, now it is becoming a, a normal for 
most of the cultural institutions is in Mexico. Um, Escuela Superior, I would like to, to, to point. We are um, a cultural social mobility project. And since the pandemic, we, we had focus on uh, finding resources so that, that, so that we don't get short on the, on the careers of the students who have enough talent to, to, study, to continue to study ab abroad. Uh, and they get scholarships by themselves uh, uh, with, for, uh, with, with institutions that invite them to, to join them. Uh, so we, uh, we are, uh, after that, that, that is our mission, to, to give uh, possibilities to, to, the, to our community of students. Uh, so uh, during these times, we communicated a lot virtually. I have a, a, a very engaged uh, board members. We are very close all the time. Uh, we, we, uh, we have committees and, and we are, are trying to do our best we can to, to survive during these difficult times. And uh, uh, we have very good uh, practice. We have practiced a lot different crisis scenarios. So uh, I think we are learning a lot together and working a lot together to, to, to survive this situation. This is great to hear, Barbara, and especially the key takeaways are that uh, while you cannot prepare for this concrete situation, you can prepare for a challenge. And uh, as Brian has pointed out, prior crises prepare you for the future ones, and unfortunately, we uh, there is no guarantee that something else won't hit us. So, and having the necessary technology to be connected is key during this time. So, thank you, everybody. I uh, am pleased to announce to you the results of our first poll. So, the uh, the respondents said that 70 in 73 percent of the cases that yes, the board has been communicating more often. Uh, but 27% said no. So some boards still stuck to their four meetings a year schedule, and that's going to be really what will uh, uh, create a longer period of coming out of this crisis as a result. Uh, in, in, during these times, this communication is truly invaluable. So let's go to the second question um, about the people. Uh, what should be the board composition um, uh, what should the board composition be? What, who, who should be on the board? What kind of people? And what should be the focus of the diversity? Um, and uh, I would like uh, to, for the second poll to be brought up and for the audience to cast their vote. Uh, please bring up the poll. So what should be the main focus of board diversity today? And you have five choices, professional background, cultural and racial background, age, gender, and stakeholder category. So whether you are representing customers or suppliers or audience members or general public or the government, please vote and we will announce the results later. So I would like to turn in the meantime to Hilda in answering the question, who should be on the board for it to be crisis proof? What kind of disciplines represented? What kind of skills, personalities, talents? And I would like you to comment on what used to be the case, what you thought was the optimal board composition versus the new reality today. Go ahead, Hilda. All of the above. Uh, the, the diversity is one of the... Uh, diversity is, you say, much talked about some, uh, a subject and people really don't know why, why does it really matter other than in political uh, terms. Diversity is to me the canary in the coal mine. It is what lets you know whether in fact a, an organization is working well or not. If an organization is not working well, a more diverse board, which is a great luxury to have, will not, will not save it. If an organization is working well, it will be taking advantage completely of a very diverse board. I would like to make a difference between what may be European boards and American boards. In, in 
in arts organizations, which get no funding or very little funding, if any, from governments, a major component quality of a board member is the ability to contribute financially to sustain in the organization. Then within either they have the, the expression is you give or you get. You may not have the money to give, but then you're supposed to get a certain amount of money. And different boards have different entrance fees. Uh, some start at a thousand or five hundred, and they can go up to fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars in the United States. So that is a critical uh, aspect of the type of board member that is accepted or looked to look looked for in the United States. Then within that give or get capability, then of course you want to you want to bring in intelligent people, open-minded people. Uh, people who have no agendas, and sometimes that's hard to preempt in, in an organization. I've been in many in which at least a third of the board have had hidden agendas, which became very obvious, unfortunately, what the agendas were, because they were acting on them. So that intelligence, open-mindedness, creativity, goodwill, understanding the mission of the organization and how you can help that mission of the organization is critical. In the United States, now with Black Lives Matter movements, most of the boards are struggling to bring more Black Lives diversity into their staff and their boards, ourselves included. Because in America, it is harder to find give or get uh, contributors to, and we need that, to, so something we'll have to give. I think the entry fee for black lives or Latino lives or, or people who just cannot bring the economic resources that you would expect from every board member, something will have to give. That, that, that entry price will have to come down or be negative if they're really terrific people. Yeah, and thank you very much for this, Hilda. But uh, uh, so many boards uh, will now go into what's, what I think of a statistical diversity without really going deep into why diversity on the board is so valuable. And the reason why it's so valuable, because it brings a variety of, pers of perspectives and not just ticking that box that you are a diverse board, but you should truly seek out talent that will bring you this extra angle that you have not been able to find, you know, maybe, you know, in people with pedigree background. And um, may go to Veronica next, because clearly in Europe, there, there is a bit of a different dynamic as to um, how people become board members and what sort of skills are uh, uh, looked for in them. Go ahead, Veronica. Unmute yourself if you have muted. Okay, I'm on now. <laughs> I yeah. feel that's so interesting because that is such an American perspective, which it, it really is so different um, from England. Uh, in England, um, most arts charities um, boards now do have about 50% um, of people on the board who are get, able to give or to get. And I think that has been necessary because of um, a decline in government funding and um, the, the ambition to expand the work. Um, but diversity is, 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 is not just about uh, ethnic origin, it's about many other things as well. It's the diversity of background, it's about the diversity of the way people think. Um, gender, I mean, I think obviously huge progress has been made in our lifetimes and most boards that I now sit on are equally male and female. But um, there's no doubt that it is much more difficult to find the right people uh, from different ethnic backgrounds to serve on charity boards because, um, but just because, because um, those who are very who are, who are well known and who are very effective are in great demand, and they're of very often artists or musicians. They have very busy lives. You don't really have the same sense of professional um, board members who are from ethnic backgrounds, but that may come as business changes and, and pe good people feed through from business. So our most of our charity boards are made up of a combination of accountants, lawyers, business people, fundraisers, comms and PR, 
digital experts. So a good board has all those talents, which at different times, the executive can draw on. And obviously during this particular crisis, that range of skills is ever more important. It really is because you never know what's gonna hit you when there's a crisis and to have a range of talent around the table um, is really helpful to the executive. And I think the important thing is that the board is there, to, as you say, to fulfill the mission and vision of the charity, but to support the executive in what, whatever way they can. And um, uh, the, the, the best boards are ones where you have a strong, wise chairman, and I don't think Asian experience can be underestimated. Um, you also have the diversity, but you also have a board that understands when um, to let the executive get on and deliver the program. So the, the, you know, that range of skills is critical. And in England, our arts charities do on the whole have a number of uh, fundraising uh, directors as well, which clearly now is going to be ever more important post-crisis. And Veronica, do you think that also the kind of personalities that join the board, the variety, is that an important factor? Because you might have um, all sorts of skills represented on the board, but if somebody is very resistant to change, uh, and as a board you're resistant to, to change, how well can you respond to, to challenges? Well, I mean, obviously, a, a good board is not resistant to change. It, it has to be, have a very clear idea of, of what its USP is, unique, 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 what the organization's unique selling point is, and how it's going to achieve it. Um, if you have people who are obstructive and who constantly cause problems, then that's for the chairman to deal with. Um, but I think most boards that I work on, certainly, they're very consensual people, are very good at listening to really experienced, intelligent people who have um, a lot to give to an executive. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Janice? Hopefully this works now. Welcome back. This, and we're so, does this we're work? So good. Yeah, this is great. Yes. So yes. Beth, oh, uh, maybe you apologies, can apologies. Apologies to no everyone. Way. I'm pleased to I'm pleased to say that the technology has been working much better on all of the boards that I sit. So it just seems to be an on go. Um, I've yeah. missed some because of the conversation. This is the unknown that we're facing. You know, here you go. <laughs> technology <laughs> sometimes tells you. But who do you think should be on the board? What sorts of talents and personalities and skills like oh, the, please go well, ahead Katya, I've, I've not heard all of the course uh, all the conversation so i i don't want to repeat what i'm sure others have already said and we don't I want wanted, to maybe I, I just wanted to give the an interesting example with the london symphony orchestra because it's a self-governing orchestra <clears throat> that means that actually the chairman of the board and the vice chairman are both players and in fact, there are seven orchestral players on the board and five non-executive directors. And that's been a very interesting dynamic in terms of both the question of stakeholders and diversity on the board, because you really do have people, a variety of people coming at this from different perspectives. And I've been interested to find that in the current crisis, there's been a real pulling together. You might expect there to have been challenges around that, particularly because there are discussions about how much you pay the freelance players who aren't playing and questions of that kind. So um, I've just been impressed that a model that I think is unlike most other places in the world, certainly very few orchestras are run by the players in this way, of course, with a professional management with them. Um, and that's taught me a lot of lessons about what is possible when you get around a table and listen to each other and talk. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Barbara, let's turn to you. Who do you think should be on the board and who is on the board that makes uh, your organization so responsive? Well, uh, well, I think a board, first of all, should reflect the people that they serve. Uh, I think we need to have people who has the pulse on the industry uh, and also people who are uh, who has a sincere and deep and profound interest in culture because uh, their job is voluntary. Uh, 
in, in my idea, in, in, in the boards that I have uh, created, uh, what I try to do is, is create a collective skill set to, to be able to, to work together. In my board in particular, uh, I have musicians, I have dancers, I have people who is very fluent with technology, I have people with vibrant personalities. Uh, uh, I, I like to, to, to have diversity of, of professions, so uh, of ages, I think right now uh, that it's uh, something that we must consider to include in our boards young people, because they are the ones who are who have the, the trends that we need to understand, the tastes that the, the young people have. We have to, to learn how they are communicating uh, and, and maybe join, join them to be uh, future audiences for us. Uh, uh, I, I think it's very, very important to have diversity. But in my opinion, having academics and people that understand what is going on is, is it is very important. Yeah, absolutely. Here is what our audience is saying. So 47%, so just under half, believe that a professional background should be the focus. And then a third, almost a third, 29%, believe that cultural and racial backgrounds should be the priority then followed by stakeholder category to have the pulse on understanding how different uh, stakeholders think that's very important then followed by age and then finally gender because i believe that it's greatly addressed in today's world so i would like to turn to brian of course i will not forget you brian go ahead no i just wanted to make a very uh distinct separation between what is happening today, I think in a positive sense, with respect to board memberships. Uh, in the for-profit business today in the United States, there is a greater emphasis in what we call ESG uh, compliance, and that stands for environmental, social, and governance. And within that, especially in the publicly listed companies, and indeed now even more so in the private equity world, people are looking for a ranking of how that company is performing in those categories. So it is evolving as a um, as a standard by which there is more attention to a broader, more inclusive, but as well a more competent board membership. And that is going to drive a lot of this change, whether it's as a result of what's happening obviously socially today or not, is a different subject, frankly, because it's, it's primarily on a um, race issue and on social injustice and that kind of thing, which is politically driven, but as well has some social and very real needs to be addressed. But on the for-profit world, they're moving very quickly on this. In the not-for-profit world, and on some boards that I have been on, uh, there has been a little bit too much of the give on the basis by which you would select certain people. I think that is gonna change as well. And that has been uh, the case, for example, uh, in the world that I work in a lot, which is in the Native American communities. Uh, the Native American communities are severely understaffed, if I can use that term, with competent, experienced Native Americans of their own tribes who've been able to handle not only this crisis, but even economic challenges going back many, many years. And so in some of the uh, not-for-profit boards, again, I've been experiencing over these years, they have not really been reaching out to competent people of diverse backgrounds. They only reach out for those who can give the money. And then with that, they attach excessive uh, strings to that give, and it becomes a little bit too much of a politically non-diverse board. It becomes controlled by, influenced by the, the, the money factor, which is unfortunately... And more of a social club, right? Wouldn't you say so? Well, it's, it's social. And, and for example, in one case, it was about how I can show you how good I am in the world of art, because my art collection reflects the best private collection outside of a museum. 
and they would just promote themselves on the basis of that. And that was not mm -hmm. the reason why they were chosen really to add value. It was more their own agenda became the issue. I'll leave that aside, but in effect, at the end of the day, it, it's very important to have a diversity of opinion, but it has to be based on competence, commitment, and a moral compass that is also looking at the overall longer term objective of why you're serving. Absolutely. Janice, go ahead. Just, just while I can, um, just to say, I also think another impediment has been in nomination committees. So boards often set up a nominations committee to recommend new board members. And that really can be a self-perpetuating oligarchy unless there really is a plan to look more widely and some techniques de deployed to look outside of the normal address books of the people on that committee. I think the best thing to do is to pick your most uh, disruptive board member and, and forward thinking board member and make sure they are on the nominations committee. <laughs> I, I recall once when I was on a nominations committee, probably being a little disruptive, and we had a long list of, and excuse me for this, Brian, men. And I said, you know, I've looked at this list and I know for a fact that at least five of these men have very powerful, very interesting, very engaged women as wives. <laughs> have we ever even thought of crossing that divide and, and considering that? And there was a kind of look of astonishment at the time. So I would just say, I think that's, that's an issue. Um, just also on board makeup, I would say that in my experience, some of the best boards I've been on, there's been at least one person who was profoundly irritating and always asked really pushy, awkward, terrible questions, but without whom we weren't a very good board. So in my experience, it really is useful to have some sand in the oyster or sand in the, in the, in the equipment that, that causes something to come out of that. Absolutely, you definitely need that challenge to, to evolve, to, res to be able to respond to things happening unexpectedly. But one other thing that is often overlooked is kind of what experience, what personal experience people bring to the board, because everybody has, has their complicated lives and sometimes these personal experiences are equally as important. For example, somebody coming out of a difficult background, coming out of a a developing country, they may bring something that nobody with a pedigree, education and top professional background, they may bring a perspective that is very unique and very valuable and particularly during these critical times. Well, thank you very much to all of you for, uh, for, for this discussion and we're moving on. We're moving on to our topic about the culture and dynamics uh, on the board. Uh, what should be the board environment, the optimal board environment to uh, be able to respond to crisis, to be able to continue to learn and if the crisis hits us to recover and then to strive? What sort of dis discussions should we be having and uh, what are those discussion styles? Uh, Brian, go ahead. <laughs> well, I will just uh, speak to the recent experience of this crisis. Uh, luckily, uh, the board of the bank on, I, on which I serve uh, instituted by virtue of regulatory um, diktat to open the board to independent directors. And those independent directors uh, are now four and each one of them has to serve on a different committee. Luckily, we were in place when this crisis started because the best that has happened is that the staff of the of the bank are beginning to complain that the independent di directors are sticking their nose too much into their business right? which i find is a very positive thing because before that we were just fed everything that they wanted us to hear and see and to a certain extent that is also a cultural thing it's very different in a u.s environment especially in a regulated entity like a bank in the u.s because there's certain obligated uh, reports from management that have to be given, whereas if, if you're thinking now of a African-based, uh, Moroccan basically regulated institution, their cultural experience is not one of divulging too much unless they have to. And usually 
it's all predicated on the political environment within the actual institution. So this crisis created that much more emphasis on us getting down to the meat of the issue without sugarcoating anything uh, to the ultimate benefit of the, of the institution itself, the clients that they serve, and obviously the society, because the bank performs very important societal uh, responsibilities and, and, and performance, particularly in a situation like this where, for example, in the country of Morocco versus here in the US, uh, most of the support from government was given at the retail level, handing out cash so that people could pay their bills versus here, it's all done electronically. And you'd be interested to learn that we found out about a billion, $800 million worth of treasury support. Uh, and this crisis actually went to dead people, okay? Because they had everything online, but they haven't cleaned it up. But in Morocco, it was actual cash. So what we see here is a need to make sure that you have the right kind of focus for the right situation and where the reporting comes in for the responsibility of the board to act collectively, but with different experiences to help come to a proper um, conclusion. So I, I just think it's, it's one of these things where culturally we're, we're, we're changing across the board at every level, in every society, and meeting the needs of the actual moment. I think before this crisis, people talked a lot at a 50,000 to 80,000 foot level about wonderful principles, wonderful ideals, great objectives, wonderful inclusion, all that now it gets to the reality of how do we really make that happen or continue to be committed to that where with an environment that is increasingly more stressed economically, stressed socially, and in the health context. Health is a very real concern, which leads to the insecurity that we have across the system right now. Thanks, Brian. And this uh, commercial perspective is invaluable here. It's absolutely great. Hilda, you wanted to jump in. Yeah. Yeah, what, what a critical difference in what's going on right now is the level of uncertainty has not subsided. We still have a very uncertain future. We do not know what's going to happen, particularly to performing arts organizations next year. We don't know if we're going to have a vaccine. We don't know if we're going to have good treatments. We don't know how available they will be made. So there is a lot of uncertainty. And in a highly uncertain future, not present, a future, you have to move. And, and, and we have certainly done that at the Orchestra of the Americas to scenario planning and scenario budgeting and sequential budgeting. And that, of course, requires more board meetings, certainly more executive committee meetings. So when we are getting a budget approved, before we would have a budget that had a certain number attached to it with expectations attached to it, et cetera, and that was approved. Sometimes it was conditional on certain things being achieved or not. Now, we, we have a whole span of possibilities and almost decision points that the board knows by a certain time we will know if we will be touring next year or not by a certain point we we need to know we have gone now into into a an, a distance learning orchestral academy mode we have now the o academy which will be probably is the first um, online orchestral academy that will be made available to musicians and that is requires a certain amount of funding. And so the depending on the number of entries and the model that we end up using for that, it's made available to the musicians we selected this year for the orchestra this year, which could not tour. So at least we made available for them the Orchestral Academy. So there are all kinds of uncertainties and responses to the different uncertainties that we have to attach budgets to and decision points to more important than anything else to get your board engaged and to buy into the fact that you're going to have to be a very resilient move quickly correct errors as you make them if you make them and and move forward with tentative steps 
Uh, and Hilda, would you say that uh, during these months, because we were kind of moved on from what used to be a more procedural environment in board meetings to something that is a more fast paced environment, something that has to be the decisions have to be taken quick and some of them are radical decisions. So would you say that the um, environment in the meetings changed? Is it more fast paced? Is it more, you know, you do you engage in more in conversations where there is constructive dissent, maybe somebody disagreeing, challenging you, you know, is it, is it the case? Because this is completely in my mind indispensable. Yeah, yes, to all of the above. The, we had our big board meeting about two weeks ago and we essentially gave various scenarios for what could happen the year after and two or three years beyond and what responses were resilient to whatever the scenario was, what were the cost implications, the revenue implications to each of those scenarios, which provided a higher level of potential return. It's a cost benefit analysis. What was the benefit of this versus the cost versus the uncertainty level? And it was a relatively complex decision-making tree and much to it because we did not know how the board was going to respond to this we have a multinational board of about 40 people 32 of which were attending through through electronic means and much to our surprise the the there were each of these scenarios had certain challenges or had aspects that we might not have thought about or ways of dealing with them that might be uh improve our decision making process which was great Right. But one of the one of them, one of the board members who was the head of one of the major consumer companies in the world uh, said, you know, if there no, would not have been a coronavirus, we would be questioning why you would not have moved already to the orchestral academy, given the success you've got, had with the global leaders program, which is a distance learning program certified by multiple universities. So, and that was, that sort of put everyone at ease. No one was any more as concerned as they might've been because there was a, a question of whether this orchestral, a virtual orchestral academy was in, in some way gonna replace the live orchestra experience, which was not the case. It was a complement to it. But to understand that, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a little bit of a challenge until these board members step forward and say, if you would not have done this, at some point we would all have been wondering why you were not doing this. And that was music to our ears. Great, thank you, Hilda. And I'm just very conscious of time. I wanna give Barbara an opportunity to tell us what kind of discussions the, uh, her board was saying and uh, if you could uh, keep it to perhaps 60 seconds or 90 seconds, that would be great. Just so that we give the audience a chance to ask some questions. Thank you. Uh, what kind of discussions we are having? Well, well uh, let me tell you, we have a, I have a very, as I mentioned before, very engaged, very active uh, board members. Uh, I want them to understand that uh, it is important for them to be champions of a specific project that we have, that, that they, 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 uh, they put a lot of, of effort. Uh, because in boards where it, it takes a lot of time, effort, sometimes money, it is important also to, to get along with people. I think the right environment to work is, is get along and be constructive. Uh, and, and make the, the, the experience of working together, particularly during mm -hmm. crisis, to be something that everybody enjoys. So you band together uh, for a shared cause. Uh, uh, we are working in, in many different uh, projects uh, right now. And, and I think uh, my, my kind of leadership toward the, 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 board, uh, the board members is, uh, is, is I see it as, a, as an ecosystem that it's supported by trust and mutual, mutual support. Uh, 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 we are. Uh, we were very fortunate to move to a, to the virtual uh, model uh, with a lot of a lot of dif difficulties, but uh, we are doing fine, and uh, we are having our meetings, meetings virtually. 
and we tried to our our purpose was more internally than externally we, we work within the organization with the faculty and the and the and the students due to the our, our economic situation in, in the in the country so assigning real responsibility to each board member is critical here and having this culture of this uh, commitment of solving real issues uh, and um, uh, a true meritocracy on the board is clearly critical. Janice, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, just, just quickly to say, um, I think also is dynamics. I think the relationship very obviously between the chief executive and the board, particularly the board chair, but the board as a whole is crucial because <clears throat> it's the executives who are doing the scenario planning. Generally, the board will set strategy, but the executives are doing the legwork and the thinking. And so um, I think in a crisis, it's very important for the trust relationship between the management and the board to hold and to be as frictionless as possible. That doesn't mean without challenge, but it needs to be trusting and mutually problem solving. Um, mm -hmm. One experience I had some long time ago now was where we as a board knew we had a weak chief executive, but we didn't act on it. And then we had a crisis and boy, did we have a problem. So right. I think I would also say that if you are in a crisis, make sure you have the right leader. But ideally, before you hit the crisis, think really hard about that. Absolutely. Veronica, would you like to comment on this? Yes, well, I must admit, I couldn't agree more uh, with what um, Janice has just said. I think it's very wise words. Um, I have a rule, actually, about joining boards. Firstly, I have to love what the organization does. Secondly, I have to admire the chairman. So often he will be uh, older and much wiser than I am. And um, thirdly, to like and, and have confidence in the chief executive. And um, when you do hit a crisis, those three elements are particularly important because you have all got to be rowing in the same direction at the same time as being prepared to be challenged. Um, so challenge takes you so far, but a, a good chairman will know to what extent you can have um, a conflict of opinion. And when you have to say, let's take this offline, or let's discuss this further, it's all very interesting, but I think we should do this. A chairman who is a good chairman, uh, and um, I've worked with many very, very good chairs, um, is, is very good at bringing out the best in people. And I come back to this point about skills, you do need skills. So, um, you know, for example, on one board I sit on, we have somebody from McKinsey. So when there's a crisis, you know, he can go away and do some uh, financial modeling. You have most organizations have audit committees. So you do need to have at least two, three, four people who are financially literate. You also have to represent the, the um, organization's um, vision in terms so with music organization, musicians and music educators. So those skills really are vital and never more vital than um, during a crisis. Absolutely. And stakeholders will uh, play a key role in the transformation of the boards, of the composition and the discussion the boards are having. Uh, so um, I would like to actually turn to uh, some Q&A from the audience to make sure that they get a chance to ask their questions. And we will address one more question after Q&A as part of a concluding uh, part of our discussion. So now on to the Q&A. Yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Aliena and I'm going to be leading the question and answer session. And we've had several questions come in while you've been discussing and actually the first one follows very nicely to where we just left off. And the first one is actually for Hilda. It comes from Peter Traver of the Z Festival in the United States. And the question is, as a founder, can you please talk to what kind of board composition in your experience works best when building a network strong enough to both financially support and strategically advise a new or emerging organization? In other words, should the age of an institution determine or influence in any way the composition of its board? Uh, yes, 
when you're starting an organization, you need people who are, are willing to, to go into a venture as opposed to an organization that has 50 years in existence as buildings have naming rights. A startup doesn't have naming rights, doesn't have anything. You're going to be, you don't really know how the organization will evolve and there will be a trial and error period. So you have to be people, you have to have board people who are willing to experiment. That may be a little bit less necessary. There's always experimentation is always was critical at any point in time and innovation is critical at any point in time but that level of complete openness to experimentation is more critical when you're a startup than when you already have 20 years like we now do we still don't have buildings which now is an advantage not to have a building by the way yeah so yes Ryan, the, the the age organization is critical the board very much has to respond to the level of development of the organization or there are certain qualities of board members and, and diversity is key among those qualities is critical yeah um brian could i ask you to to maybe comment on that as well well there's a there's a great deal of um benefit in having an institution that has a good track record over many years or decades um Hilda has spoken to the point about a startup and I agree with her, but also there is a need to have uh, institutional memory with the various board members over time, but also with a view that there are staggered boards where different people come in and rotate on a regular basis without losing that institutional memory and the experience of having been involved over the um, history and uh, that therefore being able to better build on a legacy for the organization. Yeah. Okay. Um, this next question, I will read the question first and uh, it's, it's open to anyone in the panel who would like to comment. So feel free to jump in. It's from Matias Perez, who's the president of Empresas Gasco in Santiago, Chile. The question is, or it's two questions, in your opinion, is it important to rotate board members after a defined period of time in order to ensure a range of views? Or do you think that a long-term board membership model works better? Who would like to jump in? I'll just go quick. Anyone can jump in, Brian. I'll yeah, just very yeah. quickly say that uh, it is always good for public companies to have rotating boards and limited tenure for their board members. And in not-for-profits, not depending again on the institution and the name that's associated with that institution, that individual or individuals who say represent the family or the original founders, that sort of thing, there, there, there has to be some sense as well that you keep that continuity. It could be with other members, but yes, you need to have and always want to have refreshing views and different people to keep it alive and, and, and relevant in terms of both the times as also in bringing in different skill sets. Hilda, I'm sorry, I jumped in too soon, but please. Yeah. Go, go ahead, ahead Hilda. That is. Okay, oh, okay. Go ahead, Hilda. Uh, uh, the answer is depends. There are some superb board members that should be kept forever if that was ever possible. Nothing is forever. And there are lousy board members that definitely should be rotated off if they have no way of improving their performance. And there is where a governance committee that is not political, that is fact-based, that is honest with itself, can play a major role in the rotation process. But whatever you use, whether you have term limits or you don't have term limits, you always have to allow for exceptions to the term limit rule. Because I have seen, I've been on board, by the way, I've, as a matter of fact, I've stepped off any board after 20 years, except the orchestra, because it very much still depends on my funding, et cetera. But the, um, the, uh, the, it, it, you should always allow for exceptions. Uh, that at some point, you know, there's a fantastic board member that should stay on if they're still cogent and, and contributing. And, 
and it is the board's role and the governance committee and the executives to point out when that's no longer the case. Yeah. And rotating, uh, yes, of course, the, the, the staggered <laughs> committee, sorry, the staggered boards is very important to maintain institutional memory. Go ahead, Janice. I, I would just sure. support the, the idea of rotation while also the need for exceptions, but I would just say it's much easier to remove a not very useful board member if you do have terms. It gets much harder to do it if every decision is a discretionary decision. Then that's that does get personal and difficult. That, that is correct, yeah. Well, actually, Janice, the, the next question is for you uh, from Claudio Bochat of the Batito Musica e Desenvolvimento, sorry, I probably didn't pronounce that properly, in Brazil. Uh, what is the best way, in your view, to connect board members to other stakeholders of an organization in order to make informed decisions that take into account a wide range of perspectives by those involved in a given organization? Let's think. I mean, stakeholders in the case of an orchestra, for instance, that's audience, that's the players, that's the donors, the patrons, that's the Arts Council of England, Veronica. <laughs> and it's you know, it's it's a it's a range of constituents, and I think um, I think you have to take each case on its merits as to how the board can interact with those. Um, I do think that the executives need to take the lead on those, but I think board members all have to get involved with it. I don't think that quite answers the question, but that's my view. Yeah. Would anyone else like to come in there? Okay, we'll move on. The next question is for Veronica from David Rojas from Ampro Band, which is the Spanish Association of Professional Wind Orchestra Musicians. Do you think that the presence of musicians among the members of a board of a symphony or a musical institution adds balance? Would you consider the profile of a practicing musician with added training in management the ideal board member for orchestras particularly in the dynamic time that we are living in now? Absolutely. Um, I think that um, for a music board to have musicians is, is absolutely critical. Um, again, it's a question of balance. I mean, interesting, if I talk about the London Music Fund, which is a small organization, turnover of only £500,000 a year, it was, I founded the charity 10 years ago. And interestingly, most of the accountants, lawyers, PRs, comms are also musicians. They're amateur musicians. So they all share the vision of the charity and they understand music. Um, Full-time musicians, we don't have, we have one actually on, on our London Music Fund board and that is Chi Chi, the, the, the wonderful um, founder and director of the Chinike which is, as you know, a, a, a really pioneering a young orchestra. Um, so yes, I think there's absolutely place, but I think if they have other skills as well, um, then that's, you know, you get double value. Yeah. Janice, go ahead. Just quickly to say, I think when I was on the English National Opera Board, it was very valuable to have a, a singer. In that case, it was Leslie Garrett on the board because she was actually able to speak about what was going on in the house, you know, really behind the scenes, what the real feeling in the company was in a way that none of us from the outside really could see. So she gave us a whole different perspective on it. So it was very valuable. And I've already mentioned the London Symphony Orchestra where the players are the dominant members, in fact, in terms of numbers. Brian, I can see you want to jump in. Yes, I just want to add, I used to be on the board of the Manhattan School of Music here in, in New York City, and uh, we had not only members of faculty as members of the board who rotated on and off, but also musicians, and it added a tremendous amount of uh, value to the discussions and deliberations of the board itself, because in that case, as we were speaking about earlier, there were more people who gave and the amounts that they wanted to be associated by doing what they were doing, but they had no context of what was really going on in the school and what the students were aspiring for, and what they needed, as well as a professional uh, performing musician. In that case, when I was there, it was Thomas Hampson, 
the famous baritone was on our board and he was extremely, extremely helpful in giving us a perspective of the profession outside of the school and it helped the board enormously. Um, sort of leading on from, from what we've just discussed, it's, the next question is for Barbara and it comes from Elsie Andrade, who is the co-founder of Arte para Compartir in Mexico. And the question is, in your opinion, what different kinds of professional profiles should integrate an ideal board? In the case of the board of your institutions in Monterrey, what different profiles do you look for? As, as I mentioned before, uh, a diverse, uh, diverse personalities. Uh, particularly, I, I, I'm in favor, like everybody, everybody said, I have musicians, I have dancers, I have people who is uh, in financial, I have lawyers, I have uh, 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 people that are, that are very academic, uh, people who understand our industry, the music industry and the cultural industry. And certainly you have to have thinkers and doers because you also need people who can crystallize the ideas that the board uh, has. And that is very important uh, to have people to, to make sure that those ideas crystallize. And if, if they are poorly executed, it's somebody who can uh, uh, who can uh, uh, change the direction. So I, I think diversity of ages, of gender, of professions is very important. Yeah. Actually, just on that, uh, um, an additional question from, from me, uh, would you then see if, if the professional profile is a lawyer, let's say, would you see, would you say that the lawyer is then in charge of the legal side, of course, but would you would you also take opinions from others about maybe le legality is a bad example because that's quite specialized but do you see the the person coming from a finance background as being the sole responsible then for financial decisions or do you see different professional profiles also being able to contribute to roles that would be, go beyond their background if that makes sense i think we well no, all boards needs to have i have five committees the, 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 I have the financial, the academic, the fundraising, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, I, I assigned the expert in finance in, in certain committee, the, the, the lawyer, and but, but I, I, we have been very successful in, in our uh, board right now. We are very agile. Uh, uh, the, the people is committed because. Every, every, everybody has a, a certain assignment. Not, not everybody has an opinion on, on everything that happens in the institutions. Only the expertise is used in, in certain situations. So that makes it very easy to, to flow because nobody feels like they have a, 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 so, a very, a very uh, hard thing to do understand uh we just have time for one last question before i hand over back to katya and the question is for brian from jovanka jankovic in serbia who is the president of art link belgrade and is in a uh, european festivals association board member to what extent should the board members of an organization act as part of the public faces of an organization or should their role be more of an internal behind the scenes function for the organization that's a good question, and it's one that is, um, I think, difficult to grapple because on a public board for a for-profit organization, you are by definition very public already through a proxy disclosure and board you know, uh, association and the publicity of the organization. On a not-for-profit, I would say that it, it depends, again, on, on the individual. I would think that Again, working with the um, with the CEO, the president, the leader, um, that a significant and important board member can and should be uh, available for a public involvement. Um, we were talking about the Manhattan School of Music earlier. Uh, Thomas Hampson is a very famous, you know, uh, baritone, very successful. 
and I think he could and should be seen publicly as being also a member of that board because it could help in so many different ways of um, promoting the interests of the institution both to the public and to uh, and to private audiences so it depends but I do think that uh, no one should go on a board to remain anonymous I think we should all be willing to be in effect public open and uh, I think that also helps in the transparency factors that I think society needs to see and be uh, and be exposed to Well, thank you for this very uh, stimulating Q&A session. And if I may vote, I think the question about musicians on board is absolutely a fantastic question, spot on. And I really think that musicians would add value not only on board on music or of music organizations, they would add value on any board. Their brains are absolutely unique and they would bring a perspective that, you know, perhaps other board members wouldn't have. They do have uh, almost like an X-ray vision and I've, met many musicians and the absolutely fascinating people. Uh, so we are moving on to our last section of this panel um, and uh, we will have each about one, one minute max, unfortunately. So this is about what goes on behind the scenes. Um, what sort of work should go into preparing an organization for not just a pandemic of this scale, but just known risks, even the environmental risks, the social risks. And um, if you could also add your um, concluding remarks to that, that would be great. And um, I would kind of like to draw the analogy of uh, a board being an orchestra. When they meet for their four board meetings a year, this should be for tuning the instruments to make sure that they're all on the same page. But this is not where real work is taking place solely. They, it, it should go on in a much more consistent manner. So, um, uh, so what should be the duties of uh, the board members uh, to prepare for known and unknown risks? Um, Veronica, go ahead. And later on, oh, oh, sorry, I forgot that we have one more poll and we would like to ask the audience the question or of do you see the role of the board as more important or less important in crisis recovery? Please go ahead and vote. And in the meantime, we will uh, give um, the opportunity to Veronica to answer the question. Thank you very much, Katya. Well, I think it, it's so interesting hearing about other people's experience, but I think one thing we'd all agree on is that a crisis really does crystallize the effectiveness of a board, the effectiveness of the, both the chairman, the board members, and the, and the chief executive. You know, a stagnating organization uh, that is perhaps underskilled and has a weak chairman, that's the sort of organization that may not survive this crisis. And um, you think you have to, as a board, be able to react quickly, but also think ahead. And you know, the, the vision ahead changes. You know, we we thought we, we knew a bit about the, the pandemic in February and then a bit more in March. And now in June, uh, we're actually we have a different view of it and the different countries' experience of how to handle it has changed so much. So that flexibility of thought is really important. I was I was at a board meeting today with one of my organizations, at which is very um, a, a very long standing organization, very traditional in many ways, but it is discovered that it can find a new source of revenue through a new digital program. And fortunately, um, about two years ago, it had started to completely change and upgrade its digital potential. Now is the moment to press the button, to spend a bit of money, to actually do something really imaginative. So although it's, a, it's a, an older organization, that doesn't mean it's a stagnating organization. It is absolutely open and we have the expertise on that board to help guide the executive. Um, thank you, thank you, Veronica. We do have uh, just a few minutes left and I want to make sure that everybody gets the chance to draw their concluding remarks. Barbara, go ahead. Hey, I think right now, everybody- Perhaps 30 seconds or less. <laughs> Everybody in our countries needs to, needs to understand what is at stake for our industry. We are very fragile. We are right now 
very vulnerable, vulnerable and we have to, to, to have that in mind in order to, to, have, uh, to give strategic response to our institutions and the society. Great, thank you. Hilda, go ahead. 30 seconds or less. Uh, yes, I agree with what has been said. I like very much the image in a creative setup. I like the image of a jazz quartet in which you need multiple players to be able to step in, improvise in a synchronicitous way, but be creative in the process of moving the piece of music forward. And yeah, I agree with very much with what Barbara has said that the, the whole industry is highly vulnerable. The, the musicians who are playing in the United States, who are playing in major, opera, in major uh, symphonies right now, are collecting unemployment and many of them cannot live in the cities that they were living in unless they had big savings to support them. So the, the, the future of the symphonic world, the dance world in the United States is right now very uncertain. That offers opportunity as well as drawbacks. Uh, Thank you, Hilda. And the audience. The audience also uh, yeah. thinks that the boards are ever more important today. 95% of, of the percent of the audience thinks that the board should be more involved during crisis. Brian, uh, please. Yes, absolutely. They need to be involved. I, I think I implied that with my uh, interventions before, but I will give you a not-for-profit situation in which we were very much involved, and that is the uh, <clears throat> Fort Apache Heritage Foundation of the White Mountain Apache Tribe here in Arizona. And uh, we were pulled together to help the actual tribal government to, uh, to apply for emergency relief funds during this entire COVID thing. So when you are engaged with a, I'll use uh, you know, Hilda's analogy of the jazz quartet, I'd rather prefer you know, to have an orchestra, but anyway, it, it, it does come together, different skills, and we were able to bring a, a very good uh, effort quickly to help this community. And by the way, in the White Mountain Apache tribe, it is the highest concentration of the pandemic in the entire United States as per population. So we're going, to we're going to transi transition into increasingly greater economic challenges. And this is going to be why boards are going to have to be very much involved as we try to work our way out of it. Thanks. Janice, go ahead. Just 15 seconds. Somebody, yeah, very fast. Somebody this morning said uh, yesterday in a board meeting, we have to survive well. We can't just survive. We have to survive well. And I think that takes board. It takes very skilled executives it really is all hands on deck the one thing i would say that i think boards can do before crises is look at the reserves make sure that they are pushing for adequate reserves to get them through a crisis look at insurance look at other things like that as as preliminary to the next excitement we all have Absolutely, Janice. And the boards will, good boards will take organizations into a better future. I truly believe that if they have the pulse on what's changing in the world around them, if they uh, truly adopt a stakeholder mindset. Thank you, everybody. You're just fantastic contributors, all of you, to these discussions. And I will turn over to Gosha. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katia. Before thanking today's fantastic panelists, we would like to take a brief moment um, to share with all of you a preview of our next edition. Two weeks from now on, on July 9th, the Global Leaders Program, the Spanish Association of Orchestras and Classical Next, invite you to join our next panel discussion at this same time. The upcoming session entitled who you are before what you do, culture first organizations, will explore the following questions. How do art leaders build cultures aligned with missions and values? How can organizational culture support effective vision, strategy, and operation? What internal shifts can contribute to a more equitable and impactful arts sector? These themes will be addressed by a diverse group of uh, expert panel representing, among others, Blume Haiti, the Los Angeles uh, Chamber Orchestra, the Detroit Symphony, the Washington Performing Arts Society, Loyola Marymount University, and other speakers and panelists soon to be announced. Uh, links to this next session are now in the chat.
We would also like to share the exciting news that Resetting the Stage uh, series partner Classical Next has just announced dates for its 2021 edition. This upcoming global gathering of arts and music professionals will take place from 26th to 29th May 2021 at the Dwellen in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. More information on how to participate can be found at classicalnext.com. And now we conclude by saying thank you to today's exceptional panel, Barbara, Hilda, Brian, Janice, and Veronica. On behalf of all of the public tuning in, we really appreciate you sharing your perspectives with us today. And of course, huge thanks to Katya Gorbatyuk and our colleague Alina in Classical Next for your help to moderate. Thanks to all of you who joined us from around the world today and look forward to seeing you in two weeks from now. Until then, please stay safe and healthy. Thank you so, so much, and we hope to see you soon.